crashing then. We have very low interest rates. Interest rates were going through the roof back then. I want to bring in Alan Murray, uh, President and CEO of Fortune Media Group. Alan, you remember the time very well. It was hard not to think of October 19th, Black Monday, uh, particularly after Christmas Eve, you know, uh, Monday session, half a day of session, market got destroyed. Do you see some parallels there? Yeah, I think there are some parallels. And, and you know, Charles, the thing to remember about 1987, as scary as it was, the market shuts down for a week. Uh, uh, the economy continued to grow for several more years after that. So it wasn't a harbinger of the end of the economic expansion. It was just a stock market event. Uh, now, we don't know yet how this one's going to turn out, but it could be similar. It could be. And, and what, so what do you make of it then? Because, I mean, then, you know, we had uh, Iran and Iraq firing missiles at our ships. Uh, you know, we attacked a, a, a oil platform off of the coast of Iran that morning. Uh, the markets were already breaking down. And, and this sort of how does this happen when some people believe the market is efficient? How does this happen in a so-called efficient market where, where it could be this wrong? Well, some people may believe the market is efficient. I think you and I both know that the market gets over, uh, overbought sometimes. You have periods, and particularly when you look at the extended period we had of unbelievably low interest rates, it was inevitable that you were going to see some excesses in the market, and they have to be corrected at some point. So there's some scary stuff going on in the world. I think the whole uh, the resignation of of General Mattis and all the events around that, the notion that the Treasury Secretary would uh, uh, call up CEOs and say, hey, do you have enough money on, on board? All of those things make people nervous. That's understandable. But the bottom line here is that excesses get built in the market and they have to be washed out from time to time. And uh, Alan, before, uh, before you go, you brought us some news. Uh, and tell us about this big sale. Yeah, it's very exciting. Look, I think one of the positive things going on in the media world these days is that you have people who've made a lot of money who, who think investing in media is a good thing to do. You look at Mark Benioff and Time, you look at Jeff Bezos and The Washington Post, um, uh, Lorraine Powell Jobs and The Atlantic. Uh, in our case, it's a, it's a Thai billionaire, a man named Chachaval Giaravanan, who was educated here in the U.S., got to know Fortune very well in those days, has seen what we're doing in China, believes in the brand, and wants to see us grow and become stronger. So uh, we closed the deal on Friday. Very happy to have a new owner, and I think you're going to see big things out of Fortune in the years ahead. Well, I'm going to say first and foremost, congratulations. And Thank I mean, you. I, I know that what the answer will be, but can you reassure folks that Fortune will stay independent? and not necessarily be a mouthpiece for the new owner. Oh, absolutely. He's been very clear. He's a hands-off owner. He supports our editorial independence. Uh, independence. He's going to give us the resources we need to grow and get stronger. So, yeah, no question about that. Fortune will continue to be an independent voice. You know, we've been around for 80, almost 89 years now. I think this assures, uh, assures us we'll make it strong to our 100th anniversary. 